Hello and welcome back to If Clothes Could Talk, the web series that uncovers the beautiful, the slightly strange and the wildly fascinating world of fashion history. My name is Liv Hutley. I'm an emerging costume and production designer based here in Australia who is very keen to learn about the wide world of historical garments. And I am joined by the brilliant Ellie Gunton, who is an emerging archaeologist, recent bachelor degree receiver. Oh my god. And lover of old things generally. <laughs> How you going? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. It's been a long nine months since we last talked to you all, yes. but we are ready to get back to it. Yes. And what are we getting back to, Ellie? Today we are going to be talking about the ancient Greek empire and we'll be exploring the fashion and politics of the Hellenistic era and all things Alexander the Great. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm so excited. So, okay, a brief overview mm -hmm. of the Hellenistic era, era. The Hellenistic period began with the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BCE and ended with the Roman conquest of Egypt in 30 BCE. This was a significant period of political turbulence and as Greece decreased in size and global influence and as Rome began to expand to the powerful empire that we study today. Yeah, the Hellenistic period saw the introduction of different cultural ideas and styles into Greek fashion, including, but not limited to, Mesopotamian, Babylonian, Persian, and crucially, Egyptian. Alexander the Great had created a massive empire at the time of his death, which had incorporated or colonized many different cultural groups, which meant that the Hellenistic age was a diverse cultural period. So who was Alexander the Great? Let's give you a brief recap. Okay, so Alex, the big A, born in 356 BCE, Alexander the Great, or Alexander the Third, was the eldest legitimate son of Philip II, the Macedonian ruler in the north of Greece. At this time, Greece was separated into nation states. So each section had its own king and nobility. Alex's father created a strong military foundation in this country from which Alexander united the Greek states under the Macedonian banner and then waged war on most of the Mediterranean. All of the Mediterranean. All of the Mediterranean. He famously never lost a battle. Yes, because he died when he was 33 of an alleged fever. Yes, there is a wide dispute between the academic community about exactly what that fever was. Uh, but yes, he straight carked it at 33. <laughs> <laughs> he overthrew the Persian Empire and conquered Egypt and colonized land all the way to the west of India. Alexander had a massive empire, so when he suddenly died in 323 BCE, the empire erupted into chaos. Now, Alexander's wife Roxana was expecting it this time, so when she gave birth to a baby boy, they declared that both he and Alexander's half-brother Philip would be kings together. They split Alex's kingdom into manageable chunks and gave them to generals to be governed under the two kings' rule. Sounds like an episode of Game of Thrones. <laughs> Sounds actually way more dramatic. Anyway, <laughs> so wars and land disputes continued for some time. However, they were all united under the same banner, no matter who was the ruler, because Alex had insisted that everyone learn Koine Greek. So this common language made it easier to share cultures and trade across the Mediterranean. Fun fact, this is where the name Hellenistic comes from. Helen means Greek. And while the Greeks adopted many cultural styles into their identities, probably the most recognisable cultural hybrid is between the Greek and the Egyptians. Ptolemy was placed as the general of, the, of Egypt after the death of Alexander, and the styles began to blend, creating super interesting fashion trends as well as unique burial styles and religious practices. Yeah, it was super funky. It's a good time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So I believe you got to have a really fun week this week and caught up with an expert on the Hellenistic era and the cross-cultural fashions. I sure did. I recently caught up with historian Dr. Amelia Brown at the University of Queensland, who is an expert in all things ancient Greece. She took us around UQ's Artie Milne's Antiquities Museum and gave us a look at depictions of fashion during the Hellenistic age and talk with us about the amazing blend of cultures that happened during this era. Let's take a look. I'm Dr. Amelia Brown and I'm Senior Lecturer in Greek History and Language at the University of Queensland. I teach and research in the School of Historical and Philosophical Inquiry, but especially in the discipline of Classics and Ancient History. And I am by profession an archaeologist as well as, as historian. Um, I uh, am also from October the director of the R.D. Milnes Antiquities Museum, where I'm standing right now. My uh, research also revolves around Greece, uh, ancient Greece, but also medieval Greece, the Byzantine Empire. What is your favourite era of Greek fashion? Well, it's hard to tell, actually, because there are so many fantastic eras, but I think I would probably have to choose the Hellenistic era because it is the um, era in both art, I think, and in real life of the most beautiful, high quality um, clothing and, and fashion in both women and men. My favorite artifact in the museum that I'd love to tell you about today is this terracotta figurine of a woman from the Hellenistic era. It's uh, from the city of Taranto, which is ancient Taras, a Greek colony um, in southern Italy that was really famous for its production of these sorts of small terracotta figurines. And these beautiful uh, images of women of the time were used as gifts for the dead in their uh, burials, but they were also used as gifts for the gods in sanctuaries and temples to delight the gods with the, the image of a beautiful person. Uh, and in this case, a beautiful woman. She's wearing uh, a chiton, that's the, the floor-length dress that you can see, um, but she's also wearing a beautiful blue hemation. Uh, and we're very fortunate that some of the original pigment is, is preserved. On her head, she's got a crown of flowers, uh, and her hair is long and, and curly and, and down over her shoulders. You can also just about see that her face was painted with red lips and uh, blue eyes. You just see that she has a beautiful necklace around her neck, and she would have been wearing other jewelry too, uh, which was made with tiny little pieces of clay. It's also nice to compare her costume in the round with the costume of ancient Greek women in motion, which you can see on the pelike, which is this vase to the right. Uh, and this vase uh, is red figure vase because the figure is in red and that's the color of the clay. So the image was actually painted with slip, which was then fired in a kiln and, and turned black. Uh, and you can see this woman is also just wearing the um, chiton, the tunic that's a uh, floor length tunic and has it belted up around her waist. Uh, ancient Greek women didn't wear bras. Instead, they used belts and cords and sashes on the outside of their dress to um, tie it up in various ways around the bodice uh, in order to create um, this uh, effect of, of folds cascading down. Well, we have a wonderful range of material evidence. We have depictions of what people wore in ancient Greece on statues, uh, small and large scale statues, and also in vase painting, uh, black figure and then red figure vase painting. And we also have a few actual paintings, um, uh, monumental paintings on boards. We have mosaics as well and depictions of, of clothing on mosaics. And we have a very few real pieces of clothing from ancient Greece that have survived. Uh, Greece is not a very good climate for uh, preservation of fabric, but once in a while there's a tomb that uh, um, is very, very well preserved uh, and, and sealed off. So we have a few very rare pieces of, of real clothing, mostly from tombs. Now, with that material evidence, we can also look to uh, the literary evidence. 
and that includes primarily um, poetry, like uh, epic poetry of Homer or Hesiod. Homer and his uh, epic poems is really fond of a good dressing scene. He loves to describe the heroes uh, and the heroines, the gods and the goddesses getting dressed um, and even sometimes getting undressed uh, <laughs> as well. Uh, so we have a lot of um, wonderful literary sources, poetry, but also prose too. And uh, then, you know, as uh, time goes on, when the Greeks settle Egypt and we have Hellenistic and later Roman Greek civilization in Egypt, we have wonderful papyrus documentation, which doesn't just include literature, but also letters between people, bills of sale, receipts, um, and business um, uh, documents, uh, which tell us actually a lot about not just uh, what sort of fabrics were being made, but what kind of clothing was being made and sold and how much it cost and who uh, needed you know, uh, it um, in order to go about their professions. Mm -hmm. So uh, in Athens in the Hellenistic era, uh, the gender roles were relatively similar to what they had been in the classical or archaic era beforehand, in that uh, the um, men took part in the democracy uh, and women were expected to run the household. Uh, so, uh, women and men did dress up when they went out. Uh, men dressed uh, in a chiton, that's a tunic, um, and actually women did too, but their tunic was longer. Um, so men would wear a kind of knee length and women would wear a, a floor length or, you know, a full length tunic. Uh, men would also put a cloak around themselves to uh, keep off the dust and dirt, uh, and women would as well. Uh, but women would also use that cloak often to cover their hair, sometimes even to cover their face. Uh, but uh, there was a lot of different um, expectations around how much a woman would cover up when she went out based on her social status, her class, um, her marriage, uh, uh, ability or already being married uh, and that, that sort of thing. Um, but there was a very definite um, distinction between uh, married and unmarried women and also between uh, older women and younger women uh, in terms of the amount of decoration, let's say jewelry, uh, makeup, um, you know, uh, things that, that they would wear. Whereas uh, probably the uh, most makeup and jewelry would be mar marriageable women um, who were uh, on the lookout, as it were, for a potential, um, potential husband. Uh, and they would be um, uh, very highly escorted, but also very highly adorned. This beautiful statuette of Artemis is also made out of terracotta, but it shows the goddess of the hunt, not any ordinary woman. And so she has her dress, her, her chiton, all belted up around her waist, um, and you can see that it leaves her uh, legs free to run through the woods because she was goddess of the hunt. And the, uh, the hunting aspect of her power is also shown by the hunting dog or hound that she has uh, at her side. Now she's also wearing boots, uh, which is pretty unusual. Most Greek goddesses, like most Greek women, wore sandals uh, and um, boots were worn for travel or for going in the wilderness. So Artemis is, is one of the only representations we have of a woman who wears boots because she needs them for hunting in the mountains. So what were key players at the beginning of the Hellenistic era, like Roxana and Alexander the Great, have mm -hmm. worn? So that's a very good question. Now, in their daily lives, they would have worn just the ordinary chiton and hemation, just a normal tunic and, and uh, a wrap. But uh, Alexander the Great, from the time he was a teenager, was uh, an active duty soldier and cavalryman for his father, King Philip II. And even after his father was assassinated and he became king, he continued to spend uh, most of his life, actually, um, on horseback, leading his armies of Macedonians and Greeks in the conquest of the Persian Empire. So he, when he was uh, in the field, as it were, he would have had to wear some armor. Um, and that would have been a breastplate um, of iron, um, actually, um, thin iron, but still 
heavy <laughs> iron, and uh, he also would have worn greaves, um, you know, protectors for his shins, and those would have been out of, of bronze. And uh, um, he also would wear this kind of skirt, um, uh, which was of, of leather straps, uh, basically to protect his kind of lower, um, well, lower chest and, and upper legs. Yeah, yeah. And he wore a helmet, uh, which was also iron, so heavy. <laughs> and uh, we know quite a lot actually about his um, military garb because uh, we have the excavated remains of the temple um, uh, actually where he dedicated armor and we also have excavated remains of the tomb of his father, Philip II, which includes uh, a lot of these arms and armor in it. Yeah, yeah. So he would have worn, you know, military equipment a lot. Uh, Roxana, his wife, was a Bactrian princess. So she came from uh, what's now uh, modern Central Asia, uh, north of, of what's now Iran, ancient Persia. And, uh, and she would have worn um, similar dress to traditional Greek dress, um, you know, kaitan and hamation, but uh, also probably um, more uh, tailored clothing. So uh, the Persians uh, were quite keen on tailoring, you know, um, jackets like I'm wearing and pants, trousers. Uh, and so uh, they introduced that um, fashion, basically, of wearing coats or, or um, jackets um, to the, uh, the Greeks. Yeah. So uh, the other uh, big influence that came from the conquest of, of Persia was in the wearing of jewelry, uh, especially uh, earrings, you know, men and women both piercing their ears uh, and wearing uh, more gold jewelry than they had been able to afford or than had been stylish um, before the, those conquests. Uh, and bracelets too, um, all kinds of, of gold and silver jewelry. It became uh, quite popular across the Greek world. Yes, so I've talked quite a bit about Persia, but of course when uh, Alexander conquered the Persian Empire, he also conquered Egypt. And the Egyptians were actually quite happy to uh, be free of the Persian Empire. And uh, a new empire was established by Ptolemy, the uh, general of Alexander, where Ptolemy um, adopted many of the traditions of the pharaohs, uh, including um, the costume of the, the pharaohs and of the Egyptians. So the Egyptians uh, generally wore linen uh, all year round. Egypt is quite a bit hotter and drier than Greece. Uh, so uh, that, that influence of Egyptian linen and the uh, style of Egyptian dress, uh, particularly long skinny dresses for women uh, and kilts for men, um, linen kilts uh, with many vertical pleats. Uh, so Ptolemy would have worn that as well as uh, other Greeks uh, who moved to Egypt in great numbers, thousands, um, to Alexandria but also to other cities up and down the Nile. In the Hellenistic era, Egyptian fashion influenced the Greek world in a very fundamental way. And the Greeks had already been wearing linen, but uh, the Egyptians were masters at producing the finest linen garments. And the style was also quite different. The Egyptian women wore long, form-fitting linen dresses, as modeled here by this figurine of the goddess Isis. Uh, and these long linen dresses must have been nice and cool in the hotter climate of Egypt. Uh, and they also were beautifully adorned, uh, often with dyes and embroidery, uh, and had long vertical folds that emphasized uh, the wearer's um, thinness and, uh, and height. The Egyptians were also uh, unusual in that they wore wigs. Uh, they kept their hair short, both men and women, um, but wore ceremonial wigs, um, not just for doing religious rituals, but also for parties um, and formal occasions of all sorts. All right, well, I'm standing here in front of our Egyptian exhibition at the Artie Mills Antiquities Museum, and it's a great opportunity to talk about Egyptian fashion of many different eras, but particularly male fashion, um, because uh, men in Egypt traditionally wore kilts, uh, not Scottish kilts of wool, but uh, much cooler kilts of linen. 
Uh, and similarly to Scottish kilts, they had very strong vertical folds, um, accordion folds, uh, which you can see in this figurine of Anubis, uh, the god of the dead. If you ignore the jackal head, he's otherwise wearing a very ordinary Egyptian man's attire, which is this uh, knee-length linen kilt and um, often a prominent belt to hold it up. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. Wow, how cool were those artifacts? I know, I was so excited. It was so cool. So fashion is not isolated or in a cultural bubble. It is a fluid expression of identity that changes with age, class, cultural identity, and gender. The politics of ancient Greece changed the fashion and the customs of the people dramatically. And we can see evidence of this change throughout the Mediterranean. At the end of the Hellenistic era, Rome took Egypt. It was a dramatic ending with the last ruler Cleopatra allegedly taking her own life after her negotiations with Rome soured thanks to the schemings of Augustus Caesar and the failings of her romance with Mark Antony. Rough. The end of the Hellenistic era was just as bloody and brutal as the beginning, but the 300 year period would become a huge sensation about 2100 years later in the resurgence of the classical age when men of science would take grand tours around the Mediterranean to pick up fun artifacts for their home office, which is totally whack. Please don't do that. We do not support that kind of behavior. Basically, to summarise, ancient Greece was super messy and complicated, and not at all like Percy Jackson. Actually, I think it was a lot like Percy Jackson, but instead of monsters, it was just land-hungry generals. Yeah, actually, no, never mind. It was a lot like Percy Jackson, and if you haven't read the books, you should. You should, and um, there's a new television show coming out, just a little plug. It's very, it's very, very exciting for us. <clears throat> we hope you learnt something new today, and that you have a new appreciation of the complexities of ancient Greek fashion in the Hellenistic era. And that's all we have time for today. And we can't wait to talk to you on our next episode. And in the meantime, you can follow us on Instagram. We are at if clothes could talk AUS. And if you have a question or a couple of suggestions, you can email us at if clothes could talk AUS at gmail.com. And don't forget to hit subscribe to be notified when our next episode comes out. Yes. Oh, and we have a podcast that you can listen to and that link is in our description down below. But before we go, we would like to acknowledge that we are learning and creating on stolen land. And we'd like to further acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians, the Turrbal and Yagara people in what is now called Brisbane. We pay respect to both elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. And we'll see you next time, everyone. Bye. Bye.